Right, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about defining hyperphagia. And uh, very different from what Randy just shows you, showed you, I think this will be a much more philosophical talk uh, about the theory and practice of how we assess and decide what is hyperphagia and um, kind of work our way through a whirlwind tour. So at any time, you know, if I'm going too fast, just say stop. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about defining hyperphagia and try to convince you why I'm giving this talk at all. I mean, we're all here because we're interested in hyperphagia, so we must know what we mean. Uh, but I think that we'll learn a lot when we really try to define the characteristics of hyperphagia in humans. And then I think there really are a few questions in need of answers with regards to defining hyperphagia. So we all know, and <coughs> uh, Randy made very clear, that obesity has been a concern for human population since prehistoric times. Everyone likes to show this Venus of Willendorf from 24,000 BC. Clearly this is not a, uh, a very lean individual. Uh, and that obesity clearly results from a mismatch between the intake and expenditure is also abundantly clear. So it makes perfect sense to consider how we might le get increased energy intake. And um, I think that we can, just as like Randy said, we can agree that intake does play at least some part in the uh, epidemic of obesity. These are data from the MMWR um, some years ago, 2004, showing reported energy intakes in the United States. Now, some of this might be simply a reflection that larger people need to eat more calories, but it may also be the fact that eating more energy predicts gaining weight. And I think that um, it's really important that we try to understand how we get from balance between energy intake and expenditure to an excess of energy intake for expenditures. And I think it's very important that we all use uh, the same descriptive terms, or at least understand what we mean when we use these descriptive terms. So I'm going to go through several terms that are used to indicate excessive energy intake. And I put it in the shape of a, of a triangle or pyramid because of the frequency with which people engage in these behaviors. I think all of us can understand that at least on occasion, Overeating is a very common event. Uh, and in fact, feasting might be uh, a reasonable term to use uh, to describe what almost everybody does. So for instance, um, Bob Kledges a number of years ago looked at feasting or overeating during the Thanksgiving holiday and found that um, energy increased by about 500 calories over the Thanksgiving weekend compared to pre and post. Uh, you'll notice that there isn't any compensatory decrease in energy intake after the overeating. So it's predicted that that kind of energy intake might lead to greater um, weight, at least a small amount of weight. And if we're repeated over multiple holidays over the Thanksgiving to Christmas period, might actually lead to real weight gain. Okay, so we know that when people are exposed to the Thanksgiving meal, they eat a lot. It turns out that it's not just a Thanksgiving. It really is the case that every time we're exposed to large portions, uh, our energy intake will change. We are very responsive to our environment. So here are data of macaroni and cheese um, uh, plates going from 500 to 1,000 grams. And uh, this is a study done in kids showing that the amount consumed increases. It doesn't quite double, but it increases substantially as the portion on the plate increases. Now, you know, a kilogram of mac and cheese, 2.2 pounds, is probably not what most of us have on our plates uh, at any given time. But a lot of us are exposed to buffet meals very frequently. Uh, and that allows us to think about uh, studying um, overeating behaviors using buffets like this. So in our lab, we have a roughly 10,000 calorie buffet. It has drinks, it has sandwich fixings, uh, there's cheeses, um, there's also fruits, there's chicken nuggets, which tend to get eaten almost entirely. And there are also uh, a whole, basically a whole series of um, foods that allow us to look at both macronutrient composition of the diet, because there are some pure carbs, some pure fats, and some pure proteins there as well as the total energy uh, that's consumed at one of these diets. And we can study it both in the presence of complete hunger, so after an overnight fast, or with a preload, say a fixed breakfast. And I'll show you some data from both of those kinds of things. And with those kind of arrays, we can demonstrate that there are many circumstances through the lifestyle, the lifetime that there might be overeating. For instance, to feel growth during puberty. So no one's surprised to discover that boys that are in the later, uh, sorry, I need to use this. Boys that are in the later part of puberty here, so the 10 or 4 boy who's about 14 and a half and growing extremely rapidly eats a lot more than a late pubertal girl or than prepubertal kids. And these are adjusted for some appropriate covariates like body size. Um, so uh, overeating is normative. We can see it under certain circumstances, at least experimentally, 
uh, where we expect there to be a lot of growth. Now, this is linear growth primarily in these, uh, in these pubertal boys, but under any circumstance where there is excessive growth for the size of the individual, we should expect to be able to see meal intake or food intake to be greater uh, um, for body size. Okay, so if, moving up from overeating and uh, feasting, which I guess is now completely invisible, I can still see it on my slide, uh, we can consider the possibility of individuals eating in the absence of physiological hunger. So this is the situation where we've just had a lovely dinner, plenty of food, and now comes dessert. And even though we really aren't feeling very hungry, for some of us, that will be enough to stimulate a great deal of intake. So let's uh, show an experimental paradigm for looking at that. Here's a fully satiating meal, again, about 10,000 calories offered. And then we can offer an array of palatable snacks. I don't know if you can see this. These are um, ice pops and uh, uh, a whole variety of candies and, and uh, so savory as well as sweets and snacks. And turns out they're all very well highly rated by adolescents and younger children as foods they would like to eat. And uh, after this kind of fully satiating array where kids will eat, oh, about 1,400 calories, <clears throat> which is a substantial number of calories to eat at one meal, we see that immediately thereafter, when given these palatable snacks, they will continue to eat in the absence of hunger. And in fact, those who are obese tend to eat more than those who are not obese, suggesting that this is a general phenomenon that eating post-satiety or eating in the absence of hunger uh, occurs in many individuals. But there certainly could be some uh, folks who are particularly sensitive to the situation. So eating in the absence of hunger would conceivably be another way by which one might achieve obesity. Well, above those, there are also these uh, constructs that are more psychological in nature and are uh, represented, in fact, in the uh, Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of the, of the uh, American Psychiatric Association. Things like episodes of loss of control over eating and then a full-fledged um, disorder called binge eating disorder. And uh, think of loss of control episodes as a, a binge eating junior, and we'll go through what binge eating disorder means. So um, binge eating is a disorder requires recurrent binge eating, so eating within a short period of time, a lot of food, more than most people would eat under similar circumstances. There's obviously some question as to what that means, particularly for pediatric groups where size varies dramatically. There's a lack of control over eating during the binge episode, the feeling that one cannot stop eating. Uh, and then there's more, at least three of the following, eating more rapidly, feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts when not hungry, so there's the EAH part of it, eating alone and feeling disgusted, depressed, or guilty uh, over eating. Now, these um, associated characteristics uh, are part of this diagnosis, but if you think about simple overeating, that doesn't really pertain. So there's something very special or different about how it's being defined here to make binge eating disorder. Uh, and actually has to occur with a certain frequency as well. So subclinical uh, binge eating, less than two days a week for six months, falls into the uh, binge eating episodes or loss of control episodes. When we um, looked at some kids that we studied uh, who were quite heavy in our group uh, and looked at energy intake at these kind of buffet meals I've shown you uh, and compared those who had uh, binge eating episodes and those who didn't, we found a remarkable difference in their um, energy intake, again, adjusted for factors like their lean mass, fat mass, age, sex, etc. Uh, in that uh, after a fast, the ones who had binge eating uh, episodes described, this is really just on a questionnaire, ate considerably more uh, at uh, one of these lunch buffet meals than uh, those who were not uh, reporting binge eating. And even after a fixed preload, we saw a lot more food intake. So we think that things like binge eating episodes, binge eating disorder, Pre um, are predict in increased energy intake and are certainly sounding a lot like more than just overeating. Okay. And in fact, the impact of binge eating can be shown on weight gain. This is a longitudinal study for kids followed for about four years. Those who had never had any binging versus those who had at least one episode over the last six months. The ones who um, had binging gained more weight, in fact, about 15% more fat mass over that interval. So, um, and then at the very top, I've put hyperphagia, and I'm going to really leave it up to you to decide whether I'm right and, or whether I should be putting hyperphagia at the bottom. So um, when I went to do this talk, I thought it would really be useful to figure out what was published on hyperphagia, and I found about you know, 8,600 uh, papers that used the word hyperphagia, at least in PubMed, starting since 1943. Uh, and clearly, people uh, in the world think that they know what hyperphagia means or they wouldn't be putting it in on all their papers.
Um, about uh, a third of these are in animal studies. Um, and the vast majority of them are uh, descriptions or using the word merely to mean overeating, actually. So, um, but I thought it would be useful for, to make a list of the conditions that at least I think are called hyperphagic, and we'll see what um, you folks agree or disagree on. So first, many mouse models of obesity, including the ones, the situations that Randy just talked about, uh, describe their uh, food intake when it's greater than the control group significantly as hyperphagia. And it's really this diagnosis or this statement of hyperphagia is based only on a significant increased food intake alone, only food intake. But most of the times when it's used in the human literature, it means more than that. So we see hyperphagia used in patients with syndromes associated with obesity, and particularly with cognitive impairment, like the Prader-Willi syndrome, Barty Beetle syndrome, et cetera, all these others, uh, including some rare syndromes that could also fit under the next category, but because they have neurocognitive effects, I've listed them here. Uh, and then patients with disorders where there's diminished leptin signaling, so inactivating mutations of leptin, leptin receptor inactivation, melanocortin-4 receptor inactivation, et cetera, et cetera, but also certain conditions causing leanness so as Randy pointed out, the fasted state is a very good stimulus to food intake. And uh, humans who are exposed to prolonged fasting, prolonged uh, inadequate calories will compensate by appearing very hungry and hyperphagic. Uh, but there are also some genetic conditions like lipodystrophies uh, that particularly lead to low leptin levels. Uh, involuntary energy restriction is uh, sort of the fasting or the war um, uh, issue of Holocaust survivors who were kept very low in the, vol in the calories supplied to them. Patients with untreated, for instance, type 1 diabetes, who have an obligate calorie loss, are extremely hungry. They're called polyphagic, but they are hyperphagic. And then at least some of the patients with hypothalamic obesity, at least in the early phase, appear to have great food intake and are called hyperphagic in the literature. And then there's some other conditions like glucocorticoid excess, hyperinsulinism, hyperthyroidism actually fits somewhere in here. Uh, as stimulating food intake. And then patients with these uh, psychological disorders, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder that I just talked about. But I thought it would be very instructive to read two descriptions, one from the animal literature, one from the human literature, of what uh, investigators really think hyperphagic behavior is all about. So this is from uh, Dr. Dykins, who developed a questionnaire that we're going to uh, talk about a little more in a few moments. She said, hyperphagia and Prader-Willi syndrome is associated with an aberrant satiety response in affected individuals, especially a delay in satiety, and their drive for food remains a lifelong source of stress for them and their families. Deaths in adults are typically related to complications of obesity. Hyperphage is associated with increased risk of death caused by choking while sneaking food and gastric perforations, perforations after consuming more food than usual. Now, I understand that today, most patients with Prader-Willi syndrome do not develop this same syndrome because of the way they're managed. And my you know, great plaudits are, are owed to those who have developed the strategies to avoid uh, as much trouble as these patients have had in the past. But I believe there are still at least some patients today that have every bit as much of trouble with food as is described right here. And then here's a description from a hyperphagia in rats after ventromedial hypothalamic uh, lesions. So these are lesions which typically cause extreme obesity. And uh, I pulled it actually from the first paper I could find that used the word hyperphagia from 1943, and this is Brobeck and Tepperman and Long in the Yale Journal of Biological Medicine, not one that I actually read very often, I have to say. Uh, but what they wrote was that after these lesions uh, were induced, when the animals were just recovering from anesthesia, when food was given to these rats, they ate voraciously. They voraciously gnawed, ate their chow pellets. At least three rats suffered acute, and in one case, fatal dyspnea from inhalation of food particles. And because of the veracity, the ver veracity, the rats increased their body weight by as much as from 20 to 23 grams within the first 18 hours following operation. And when these rats were then restricted by feeding them daily a normal amount of food, they again ate quickly and greedily, consuming in some instances a day's portion in less than an hour. So to me, these kind of descriptions are more than just overeating. They're overeating plus. So if we accept the fact that there might be something that's not exactly hyperphagia, uh, not the same for hyperphagia and, um, hello, are going? Yeah, if we accept the fact that there's something other than overeating for hyperphagia, what are the characteristics of hyperphagia? And I'm going to concentrate entirely in humans because um, I know this literature much better. 
So we'll start first with the overeating component because I think that's the part we can measure most easily and really all agree on. So um, there are a number of reports attempting to uh, quantitate overeating in, in the hyperphage of Prader-Willi syndrome patients. Uh, so this paper from Holland's group used um, sandwich quarters and uh, had them eat until they were no longer full and you can see the cumulative energy intake in sandwich quarters that were consumed by the patients with Prader-Willi syndrome in the white line is much, much higher than controls. Unfortunately, in this paper, the controls have a BMI of 22 and the Prader-Willi patients have a BMI of 33. So it's really a very poor experiment. Uh, and the reason why we say that is because, as everybody here knows, uh, we eat to, sur to support our body tissues. And as fat-free mass and also to some extent fat mass increases, the energy intake required to maintain weight increases as well. These are data from kids uh, using, measuring energy expenditures, really, by doubly labeled water, uh, the collaboration of Dale Scholler. Uh, but you can see that over a wide range of sizes, the fat-free mass here goes quite considerably in children from uh, less than 20 to over 60 kilos of fat mass. The amount of energy expected to be eaten for weight maintenance so that energy intake equals energy expenditures is, uh, is rising as weight rises. So we can't really use that kind of experiment or any data generated from an experiment like this to decide what is hyperphagic. But fortunately, there are some better studies. Um, so Fieldstone and Ziff uh, looked at uh, another group of patients with Prader-Willi syndrome against controls that had about the same BMI. But in order to do this and have them have about the same body weight, they were comparing uh, individuals of quite different age. But given that um, caveat, we'll note that, uh, again, the cumulative sandwich intake was much increased in the patients with Prader-Willi syndrome. So it's not only that it's a higher number, but that it, takes it continues for a much longer time. So that's really, there's two aspects of this. That, they, that the folks who are um, uh, controls, they stop eating after roughly 15 to 20 minutes. And I think that's generally the case in all of our eating behavior studies. That after about 20 or 30 minutes, energy intake is pretty much over but the folks with Prader-Willi syndrome continue to eat unabated. Whoops. Okay. I don't know what I did. Anybody know what I did? Okay. Well, I'm helpless without my slides. So um, we'll hope that uh, this will come back on right away. <laughs> Um, right, so uh, the folks who are um, obese who have Prader-Willi syndrome clearly are different in terms of their energy intake. And the following slides that we can't see yet, but hopefully we'll see in only a minute, uh, will show similarly that there are food intake data from a number of conditions that we've list I've listed on the slide as potentially hyperphagic. Um, so folks with various disorders of the leptin signaling pathways have greater uh, food intake. Pardon me? Ah, great. Well, that was much faster than I expected. I'll try not to do that, whatever I did, <laughs> if I only knew. All right, so leptin signaling pathway defects uh, clearly are associated with greater food intake. In this case, it's being graphed as the energy intake per kilogram of lean mass, so taking into account that body size issue. Folks with leptin deficiency, those with two inactive alleles for the melanocortin uh, 4 receptor or partially inactive MC4Rs all seem to eat more energy at um, not fully satiating meals than controls. The reason why I say this is even if you had um, uh, 50 or 60 kilos of fat mass, we're not talking about that many calories here. So it's really not an enormous amount by our standards. Um, and uh, in fact, it can be reversed by leptin, by leptin treatment. So here's one paper from Julio Licinio's group showing that in the absence of leptin, a patient with leptin deficiency decreases their energy consumption dramatically by about seven or 800 calories a day. This is per 24 hours it, when leptin is returned. So the contra contrast is also true that without leptin, they're eating considerably more per day. Okay. And it's not just in leptin deficiency. Here's some data we collected a bunch of years ago showing that the hypoleptinemia of lipodystrophy causes a hyperphagia that is reversed by leptin treatment, uh, just like in leptin deficiency. Okay, so I think we can all agree that there's a, a big effect of overeating in these conditions that we want to call hyperphagic. But we think there's a little more than that, and it has to do with our assessments of hunger, satiation, and satiety. So hunger is very clear. How hungry do we feel at any given moment? That's a subjective um, 
feeling, and we can really uh, address it only by asking subjects how they feel. And typically it's done with visual analog scales, which are of dubious um, uh, relationship to actual hunger, but at least seem to respond in the right direction between fasting and feeding. Then satiation uh, is uh, how long does it take for you to feel full? Satiety is how long do you remain full once you've eaten and felt full? Okay, so there's a little bit of data, most of it, of course, from Prader-Willi syndrome, because that's where the best data actually are for these. Um, again, this is not a very well matched control group, so when I say the best data available, that's the best data. Uh, showing that hunger scores are uh, on these visual analog scores, so remember we're doing that in patients with some neurocognitive defects. Anyway, they report themselves more hungry at baseline. Remember in that study I showed you they ate a lot more than the controls, but eventually they become as un unhungry as the controls, but at a much later time. And then, uh, and then at least in this study, they show a more rapid recovery of hunger, suggesting that they're ready to eat again. So it took them longer to become full, they remained hungry longer, and then they're ready to eat again at an earlier time point. Um, and we can show the same thing in patients, at least with uh, lipodystrophy-induced leptin deficiency. Here we're looking at uh, the time to resatiation at a meal at baseline and then after being given leptin for these kind of folks. So we can see that, um, and this is in two conditions, uh, standard fast, and then after a preload, it doesn't really matter. Uh, whatever we do when we give leptin, we um, decrease the amount of time necessary to reach satiation and, in fact, lower the calories consumed. So this is really uh, clearly indicating leptin's role as a tonic factor in not only um, amount of food consumed but also the uh, times of satiation and satiety. Uh, and here's some data from binge eating. Again, the same kind of cohort of kids who report binge eating or non-binge eating, showing that after a buffet meal or after a, a breakfast meal, the satiety duration is markedly decreased despite eating more at this buffet meal in the binge eating children. So that once again, they're ready to eat at an earlier time, uh, either after this fixed breakfast meal, which was set per calories for their size, or after this free buffet meal where they ate a lot more. So there's a satiety defect in binge eating disorder as well. Okay, so beyond overeating and uh, these uh, characteristics of meal dynamics, which you cannot see, uh, there's some other factors that I wanted to mention that I'm not going to go into such excruciating detail uh, as I just did, which is uh, problems with preoccupation with food, sometimes called hyperphagic drive, food-seeking behaviors, such as eating at night, stealing food, foraging for food, taking it out of the trash cans, the kind of behaviors that um, led me many years ago to have a slide with a locked refrigerator when I talked about Prader-Willi syndrome, but I took taken that out now because I don't think it's as common. Uh, but this is still a major part of what we think hyperphagia is. And then these other associated psychological system, symptoms about distress and functional impairment. So how bothered are you by what, you know, what's happening, by your overeating, and uh, how sad does it make you? Okay, so um, the, probably the best, uh, as far as we know, technique we can use to measure these things is to look at, uh, at least for patients with, with neurocognitive defects, is uh, the Dykin's questionnaire, which has three components that are completed by a caregiver, so it's really reporting about someone else. And we can assess drive for food with these questions. So how upset does your child become when denied a desired food? Once your child has food on their mind, how easy is it to redirect your child away from it? How persistent is your child in asking for food? And when others try to stop your, food, your child from talking about food, does it lead to distress? So these are important uh, aspects of the, the uh, drive to eat. Then there are, uh, there are some questions about hyperphagic behaviors. So bargaining or manipulation, forging, uh, getting up at night, stealing food, and how clever or fast is your child in obtaining food, which I think is a very, it's, a, it's clearly from a, you know, not an American who would use clever. Anyway, uh, and then hyperphagic severity, I think, is very poorly um, uh, presented in this questionnaire. It only is, has two questions. So the question is, how much time does your child spend talking about food or engaged in food-like behaviors? And to what extent do food-related thoughts or behaviors interfere? So I think the severity, the, f the dysfunction induced by the overeating and hyperphagia isn't really well ca captured by this particular questionnaire. Now, this is not the only tool that's been used to try to assess these behaviors. Oh, sorry. Of course, it's very useful. Here's some data from um, uh, our group, John Hahn, studied patients with Wager, Wager syndrome, some of which have a deletion that also deletes BDNF, some of which have a del has a deletion that does not delete BDNF. 
And the ones that um, have BDNF deleted are much more obese and also have higher hyperphagia behavior, drive, severity, and of course the total score. And this total score value is about what you see, not quite, but almost what you see in prader willi syndrome in the historical cohorts. Okay, and then there's some other questionnaires that are, have been developed to assess these, uh, these characteristics of behavior, drive, and severity. These are all completed by the subjects. They weren't really designed for patients with neurocognitive issues. They were designed for patients who are heavy to try to differentiate them in some fashion. So there's the three-factor eating questionnaire, which was developed by Stunkert and Messick uh, many years ago. I think it's 1995. Uh, and I just listed one question from each of these. Since I'm often hungry, I sometimes wish that while I'm eating, an expert would tell me that I've had enough, or that I can have something more to eat. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wouldn't it be nice to have that? Um, then there's the power of food scale that Mike Lowe developed. Here's one of the questions among many. I find myself thinking about food even when I'm not physically hungry. You can see that those kind of questions are reminiscent of what you might have in a normal person who was quite hungry because they, were, they had starved themselves, but also reminiscent of the kind of questions being asked in the Dykens questionnaire developed specifically in prader willi syndrome. And then the Dutch eating behavior questionnaire is one more that has a uh, specific section uh, about uh, hunger and if you have something delicious to eat, do you eat it straight away or can you hold off? So these kind of questions are all getting at the same idea of the difficulties of handling food, but none of them um, can do anything but ask how you feel about things or, or how it bothers you. And so all of these really are, to my mind, as an experimentalist, unsatisfying because I can't quantitate it objectively. I'm, I'm left with subjective reports. So, so there's this list of characteristics that I think are really found in hyperphagia in humans. Yes, overeating, severe overeating. Yes, some defects in related to hunger, satiety, and satiation. Yes, some psychological issues that are much harder to pin down. Uh, and so um, when we return now back to these conditions called hyperphagic, you can see that except for the mouse studies where there aren't so many experiments that have really tried to stress anything besides just total intake, a lot of the conditions listed here do have many aspects of what I've just spoken about, um, including the, the ones, for instance, the inactivating mutations for leptin. The, the kids are miserable who have this until they're treated with leptin. So they actually do have some of these uh, psychological problems as well. So uh, hyperphagia metaphorically, I think, has suffered from the, you know, the problem of the elephant and the blind man, where each of them is looking at one different aspect of it. So the leg looks like a column, and the, tr the trunk looks like a snake, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think we could uh, think that uh, there's really a hyperphagic elephant in there, and there are focused scientists focused on all different aspects of what might be part of the diagnosis of hyperphagia without fully putting it together as a syndrome of hyperphagia. And there are these things that we've talked about, preoccupation with food, food-seeking behaviors, problems with impaired satiety, maybe eating in the absence of any hunger, psychic distress, binge eating behaviors, all of these factors are really part of the story, but I don't think we have a satisfactory definition, really, of hyperphagia. So if I come back to the questions in need of answers, and uh, my first question is, do you think it is useful to define hyperphagia separately from overeating in animal and human studies? I mean, clearly my answer is yes, but that doesn't mean it has to be yours. Uh, and if so, how should overeating and hyperphagia be defined for animals and human studies? I think we can agree that overeating compared to a control group can always be defined as a statistical p-value, you know, that's less likely to have occurred by chance. Should, it, should overeating um, beyond normal weight trajectory be considered hyperphagic behavior? Should there be a requirement for a satiety or satiation defect? Should there have to be associated symptoms, for which I'm not um, entirely comfortable the best way to assess in animals, but I know that some, t some of the people who are here today will perhaps talk about some of the ways in which we do that. And how do, might we standardize and create objective assessments for hyperphagic drive severity and behaviors to facilitate cross-sample and perhaps even cross-species comparisons and so really allow us to understand how well our animal models reflect the human situation and vice versa. So I just want to stop by thanking the folks who do the work. Um, in particular, I've shown a fair amount of work by Lauren Shoemaker and Joan Hahn and Marion Tanowski-Kraft uh, and the other folks who work with me, and uh, thank you very much.